Live from New York City for our audience worldwide, Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, equities sinking towards a bear market, driving treasuries to a second week of gains as Chair Powell commits to bringing down inflation. We begin with the big issue, another week of messy markets. Long duration assets are taking on the chin right now. Every single headline is negative. The way that the market is reacting is as if there's a recession coming. The Fed is going to hike 50 basis points in June. They're going to hike another 50 basis points at the end of July. The consumer narrative is starting to fall apart. Potential uh, weakness from consumers are already starting to come through. Recession is coming at some point and the Fed needs some room. Everybody hoping for a Fed put is going to be sorely disappointed. What I think we're seeing now is a flight to quality. There are opportunities emerging. I understand the argument for 320, 10-year uh, being the high of the year. 3% kind of across the curve feels uh, like good value. I still think that the capitulation is to come. In the next you know, several quarters, could the Fed uh, continue to lean even more hawkish? The bond market doesn't peak in yields until something changes. Joining us now to discuss Manual Life's Francis Donald, All Springs, George Borey and Jim Caron and Morgan Stanley. Francis, let's start here. Equities, bear market territory, the one big question everybody's got. Have we seen the worst of it yet? Oh, probably not. Every leading indicator we have of this economy says it's going to get worse. And when we're listening to the Federal Reserve, there's nothing much there to indicate a pivot is coming in the next few weeks. That doesn't preclude factors that are non-macro from giving us some dead cat bounces, a little bit of movement here. But if you're relying on the macro side of the picture, there's very little support for this market in the next few weeks. Jim Karen, your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think it is pretty interesting right now because I, it was a lot easier when we can blame the decline in risky asset prices based on higher interest rates, right? We could always blame higher interest rates for all of the problems. Today, it's getting a little bit more difficult. And what it's suggesting is that the markets are now saying that the supply shock, which has generated inflation and the Fed's response to inflation, is now creating a demand shock and that demand shock is weakening growth growth expectations are coming down and that translates even into earnings and earnings earnings growth rates and potentially even higher default risks so i would argue that uh you know i, I agree with what francis is saying the worst is probably still ahead um and now as we think about the deterioration of demand going forward that's going to hurt fixed income prices probably a bit more in terms of spread and credit riskiness george borey your reaction please Hey, Jonathan, I think the, uh, you know, sort of what could be topping out in here, though, is, is inflation, um, at least the rate of it, and, and at least maybe a bit of a pause. And a pause would be good. And I think what you've seen over the last, say, couple of weeks, last week or so, is that fixed income markets have started to sniff out that pause. And a moderation, a little slowdown in inflation will take the edge off of fixed income markets. I fully agree with my colleagues that the economic impact and perhaps even the, the financial performance from, from an operating standpoint is still to come, but financial markets are very bearish right now and they are, they are pricing in a high probability of a continuation of high inflation and now increasingly you know, a higher probability of a hard landing. Those probabilities might be too high in the near future. And I think that's where the market, you know, could see some consolidation over the coming weeks. Well, let's have that conversation right now, because, Francis, I know you've got a pretty strong view on slowing growth and not just on price pressures persisting, but slowing growth specifically. Can you speak to that now? Well, one of the things that happens that I don't feel has well permeated the macro narrative is that we're still in an inflationary environment, but the nature of the inflation has changed quite a bit in the last few months. So I agree with George, we're going to see this declining inflation expectations. But the problem is we moved from COVID inflation, which was discretionary items, goods, if you didn't want a Peloton, you survived, towards conflict inflation, food and energy, much more difficult to, to uh, have a monetary policy response to that's effective. And as my colleagues have noted here, is going to have a bigger drag on demand. So even though inflation is going to slow mathematically moving forward, I'm more concerned about it now, believe it or not, than I have been for the past two years. And this is why we're rotating from that inflation concern towards the growth concern. I suspect the Fed will have to do that too, but the bar to that is very high. Well, Francis, talk to me about that. 
that. That's the one question a lot of people have. What's the threshold for Federal Reserve capitulation? The point at which they back away. It's not this. We've heard all the Fed speak over the last couple of weeks. They haven't mentioned the equity market. If they have, they seem to be comfortable with what's happening. They haven't really talked about credit. If they have, they seem to be comfortable with what's happening. What's the threshold for them to back away? Probably need to see two things happen. And the first one, I think, is inflation expectations. The central bank can't say it directly. None of them can. They can't combat this month, next month, the month after that's inflation print. Nothing they're going to do is going to bring down food and energy prices in the very near term. They are worried about de-anchored long-term inflation expectations. Those have to continue to stall or decline. But watch those initial jobless claims, some of those sum indices that we've seen in PMI data. Those are starting to show us that employment might be getting impacted at the margin. The bargain is higher. They're not just wanting to see a deterioration there. They're going to have to get concerned about that. I don't think we see that for another couple of months in the data for them to really feel secure that a pivot is OK and going to be well accepted. And Jim, that's the problem for a lot of market participants, that for the Fed, there is this belief now that what we're seeing play out in financial markets, in equities, in credit, worldwide, is a feature of policy. It's not a bug. It's the objective. Do you think this is the objective? Yeah. So, so, so John, I, I think you're asking a very good question here. And, and I, I hate to say it this way, but uh, we may be on the verge of a policy mistake. We have to think about what the policy reaction function is for the Fed, how they actually respond. What we're seeing is a supply shock that we had that created goods inflation has now stayed around for long enough that it's become something a little bit more permanent, which is wage inflation. So what the Fed is effectively trying to do is bring down wages. When, when Powell spoke at his last press conference, he, he made this illusion. And essentially what he said was that inflation's high and the reason is because high wages. So what he's really saying is that the bubble is in the is in the jobs market and we have to reduce demand in the economy, we have to slow the economy down enough such that we get wage inflation lower. As you bring wage inflation lower, what you start to hit is consumption and consumers eventually. We're not there. But here's the thing. Can the Fed actually impact wages right now? We have such a tight labor market at this point. They may not, their policy reactions may be hurting other asset prices, may be doing other damage in the economy, but it may not be going exactly after what they're trying to solve, which is wage inflation which means that they're just going to continue to push rates higher until they get wage inflation lower. So when you say, where do they back off? Right now, I don't think they're as concerned about the equity markets. The, the credit markets have hung in relatively well. Um, yes, spreads have widened, but this is no disaster whatsoever. Yeah. So they're going to keep pushing until they get wages, wages lower. And just by definition, if they respond to the data and not the market, they will be late. George, I heard from a guest earlier this morning saying that this Federal Reserve would be looking to jolts. The most recent jolts date is March, it's May 20th. So if they're waiting for jolts to come down, if they're waiting for the labour market data, that's a commitment to be late in between. If you don't respond to the market, if this is the objective, a feature, not a bug, George, you're going to do some real damage, aren't you? Well, I think, Jonathan, you know, there's, there's the economic considerations which actually provide the Fed with a fair bit of time to react. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about employment reports. We're talking about growth. These, these tend to move over like long and relatively, you know, sort of slow moving reactions. The Fed's been very clear. They're going to move until they're going to move until they see an economic consequence of their movement. There's big lag times between policy changes and the actual economic implication. I think more importantly, in the near term, you know, the question is, is the Fed going to be forced, forced to become more dovish because capital markets or the financial markets actually start showing signs of either cracks or shutdowns in some cases. The Fed can get forced to the table to sort of moderate the pace of tightening or it's sort of it's it's sort of desired to to, to tighten liquidity um, sort of financial conditions when the capital markets sort of can no longer absorb it and and sort of like a, it's a technical consideration but it's an important one because the Fed you know we know what their stated mandate is it's prices and it's employment but they also need to keep the financial system functioning and as we've seen in prior crises the Fed will take their foot off of the off of the brake pedal if capital markets seize up. Now, we haven't seen that to date, but yeah. liquidity conditions in f specifically fixed income markets are getting worse and worse. This is a material consideration and a growing risk that doesn't get nearly as much airtime as 
personally we think is, is warranted and is going to get worse as we both go into the summer, the less liquid months, and the Fed continues to turn the dials. That's the real risk, is do capital markets sort of crack because of the tightness long before the real economy does. George, I'll give you the airtime right now. We can talk about it. We have time together. Financial conditions are tightening. That was the stated goal. That is the goal. That's how you get monetary policy through into the economy, through financial conditions into the real economy. That's the goal, the objective. Let's talk about market functioning. To Jim Caron's point, companies can come to the fixed income market, they can raise capital, they're doing it at a higher level. We've seen credit respond to interest rate risk. Only very recently have spread started to gap a bit wider. So in your mind, George, just run through it point by point, how you would gauge a situation that you think is more troublesome, that should be more troubling for this Federal Reserve. So I think the observations within the fixed income market, it's an over-the-counter market. You have to find a buyer for every seller and vice versa. So we look at the spread differential between where you can buy and where you can sell. As those spreads widen out, it means liquidity is getting getting less strong or it's getting weaker. We have seen that. In, you know, sort of, We've observed it. We see it. We're watching it very closely. The second is how much sort of volume can you trade without moving the market? Again, another sign of liquidity and sort of liquidity conditions. That number is starting to go down rather than up. And then do you go to get like the worst case scenario are sort of air pockets, price gaps, points in time where it becomes very difficult to execute. That has not really been the case. You know, we're seeing signs of weakness, but we've yet to see those types of air pockets or those sort of material gaps in the ability to execute. But as we've seen in the, but as you point out, financial conditions have been tightening and you are seeing sort of bid ask spreads widen out and the ability to sort of move big volumes of risk through the system is getting more and more difficult. The last point I'd make is just can companies raise money? Well, they can. We've seen the market reopen this week. We've seen some corporates come. We've even seen a few high yield issuers come. But the level, the rates at what they're at what they're um, able to raise uh, money at is materially higher, reflective of the market, and in some cases significantly higher than where even their existing debt is being priced. All this tells me financial conditions are tightening and tightening quickly. That needs to be factored into people's sort of thoughts and their equations when they think about kind of how to invest in fixed income going forward. We'll continue this conversation on this topic. George, Jim, Francis sticking with us. Coming up on the program, the auction block. Junk bond sales on hold, heading for the slowest May since the financial crisis. That conversation up next. Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block where we kick things off over in Europe with a two-day debt spree, pushing weekly sales above 44 billion euros, the highest volume in eight weeks. In the US, high-grade bond sales topping forecasts for the first time in three weeks, 22 deals in just the first three days of trading. And finally, Carnival setting high-yield debt in an otherwise vacant market, heading for the slowest May since the financial crisis. Sticking with credit, PGM's Mike Collins starting to see some opportunities in this messy sell-off. Investment-grade corporate bond spreads were at 80 basis points over treasuries. That was really full. They've almost doubled, right? They've gotten to that 150 territory, which historically is pricing in a pretty high probability of recession and certainly starts to flash value to us. You get into 160, 70, 80, you're supposed to buy aggressively. And the high yield market, I would say, has similar uh, trends. But it's not time to get all in yet into credit. Jim Caron, I want your view on this. You say we're going from the great reflation to the great revaluation. Have you seen enough yet? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I think we're close, though. Uh, you know, as Michael was pointing out, uh, you know, we have seen a widening of spreads, but, um, you know, nothing that we would suggest, you know, would be of any historic relationship to what we've seen in interest rates. So when we talk about financial conditions, we've seen lower equity prices, we've seen higher interest rates, we've seen a stronger dollar. We really haven't seen enough pain in, in the credit sector to really start to slow demand growth down to bring probably inflation lower. So, look, I, I would look at IG investment grade credit. 
credit and say, you know, there are certain sectors of the market that are attractive. We still kind of like the financial sector. Other areas like, um, yeah, consumer staples and um, retailers, you know, these are areas that are, are, are probably going to get a bit weaker. Um, so in, 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 in other places like high yield, for example, like, you know, gaming, leisure, lodging, those are areas that have been improving and, and are coming up. And I think those are great opportunities. Um, energy is obviously, you know, very good, but we have to stay away from other areas like pharma where there's, where there's some problems. So I'd say that from a broad index perspective, I would argue that if we can get towards closer towards an 8% yield and high yield, and we're close, we're about 25 basis points away, that's where it starts to get interesting to me if we get a little bit wider in spread. And in investment grade, same thing. If we get um, maybe about 20, 25 basis points wider in spread, get high yield, sorry, investment grade yields up closer to 5%. That's where it starts to get very, very interesting to me. I'm not willing to um, take a big gamble on these sectors just yet, but I do agree that adding high quality duration to portfolios makes some sense. If you are just tuning in, equity's down about 2% on the S&P 500. Not a big day considering what we've seen over the last couple of months, but down more than 20% from the record high in early January. The Nasdaq down by close to three percentage points. Francis, we've seen a lot of this in the equity market. What's interesting about the bond market, credit more specifically, and corporate credit, back in late 2018, we saw spreads aggressively wider. We've only just started to see that really kick in more recently. We have adjusted to interest rate risk and now starting to adjust to credit risk. Francis, I think the difficulty people have in corporate credit right now is trying to understand whether that story has only just started to develop, whether the ending is still further, much further down the line. I'm glad you bring up 2018, and I agree with Jim on so many of his points here. Often when economists are asked about the credit space, they're asked, is there a recession or is there no recession? Even though I've been in the material slowdown camp for a long time, I don't have a formal economy-wide recession in my model. But what we are expecting is there are going to be segments of this economy that are very much recessionary and have yet to see that decline. So far be it for a macro person to tell you to be looking sector to sector, but I'm with Jim on this. The slowdown that's coming is still going to be isolated. It's going to be isolated to certain areas of the economy, and that's where credit has to catch up. That equities have maybe had a little bit more understanding of with home builders and retail discretionaries falling much more aggressively than the broad index. George, with that in mind, is this a world where equities lead credit or credit leads equity? I'm firmly of the view that that credit does tend to uh, tend to lead. I mean, it's the grease on the wheels that kind of keep the wheels moving. And, um, you know, as we've just pointed out, you know, sort of yields have moved up pretty dramatically. And what credit's telling me today is, is are two very, very simple things. And, and first and foremost, spreads are important. It's a good sort of proxy. It's a good kind of gauge. But at the end of the day, it's just a differential. We're looking at corporate yields relative to treasury yields, and are they going wider or are they going narrower? That's very important when either yields are low or stable. As yields go up, the dominant decision is sort of what's the aggregate yield level and what's the price I need to pay to get that yield. And so when we look at, say, the corporate credit market specifically, very you know, it's, sectors are important. Don't disagree with that. We spend a lot of time looking at sectors. But also, where are you on the curve? long duration investment grade credit that you can buy sort of at 85 cents on the dollar. Now, admittedly, coupon's gonna be pretty low. That's gonna accrete to par as we move through time. Even if we go into a recession, you know, the sort of the issuers in the investment grade universe, very, very high probability to pay. So we like that characteristic, that big price differential that's going to add a little bit of appreciation as you move through time. The other end of the spectrum, the very front end of the curve, low rated credits, which have been hit pretty hard, both for, for rate reasons and now for 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 sort of economic reasons, so shorter duration, higher quality, high yield, and say that double B part of the market, so the very top end of, of high yield, good companies, good operating cash flows, nice sector dispersion. And you are talking about yields in the four or five, maybe not quite six, but four to 5% type of range like that as well. So you can kind of create this barbell, very high income at the front end, very nice credit convexity at the long end. That's a good strategy. Jim, days like these are days where some people start to get worried. They may even use the P word. They might start to panic. I've caught up with a lot of people over the last few months that have built up quite a big cash position. And they've said repeatedly that they want to provide the liquidity. 
in bad moments, not demand it. So, Jim, with that in mind, for the people who have built up that cash position, for moments like this, what would you suggest they do with it today? Wait or do something about it? No, I would start to do something about it at this point. You know, I think we're probably priced against 75, 80 percent of this of this re of this major re pricing that we're going through this major revaluation you know so look i mean I, I think interest rates rising could ex it can explain most of the losses this year in financial assets now we're in that final stage of now it's about the risk premium it's about thinking about how much you want to what, what valuation do you want to place on forward cash flows on forward earnings and things like that what kind of default risk might we get um so so this is really where as you said this is where people start to get very very worried and panic a little bit and this is really where the bargains start to come into the market. So when the, from the Fed's hiking interest rates and we're pricing in higher rates, there's no bargains. It's just beta. It's just trend. We can't do much about that. At this point, what we start to see is a differentiation, you know, across different assets, across different sectors. And we can see some of the, some of the, probably some of the misvaluations. And one of the areas, John, that I'd like to highlight is the mortgage market. I think with quantitative tightening being priced in, there's been a lot of worry in agency mortgage-backed securities, which have pushed spreads and yields very, very high. And a lot of the credit that floats off of that um, off, off of agency mortgages is very cheap. You know, you can get, you know, high, you know, investment grade rated uh, mortgage backed securities somewhere in the five, six percent range, um, which is really just about valuation. Consumer credit is still good. Delinquencies are, are very, very low. Jobs are strong. Yeah. So, you know, so, so these are areas that I think that people can actually start to look into. Jim, awesome to catch up with you, sir. Thank you to George Borey, Jim Caron, and to Francis Donald. Wonderful to catch up with all three of you. Your equity market's down 2%. Your week ahead. Up next. Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. We are in bear market territory in this equity market. Let's get to your final spread the week ahead. Coming up, President Biden meeting with the Prime Minister of Japan on Monday, plus Fed Presidents Raphael Bostic and Esther George speaking. US and Eurozone PMIs coming out on Tuesday. The FOMC minutes on Wednesday, followed by US GDP and jobless claims on Thursday. We round out the week with personal income and spending on Friday. From New York City, try and enjoy your weekend. From New York, this was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg TV.